So welcome Masami Hayashi Smith. It's really a pleasure to have this chance to talk with you. Yeah, thank you. And for our families who don't know, you're one of our fantastic and beloved Sing Play Move teachers. And we've put the weekly classes on hiatus during the COVID pandemic, but we've been doing our monthly virtual sing-alongs. Tell us about your musical upbringing, why you decided to become a musician and music teacher. Yeah, um, I'll, I have a lot of gratitude towards um, my family for just infusing my life with music from a very early age. My mom thought I was way too loud inside the house or noticed that I was incredibly loud and felt like I needed a place to um, to express my loudness. And so um, I became active in local like music theater and local opera companies. And so it's just like music and expression was a big part of my entire life. I took lots of classes. And when I got to under, actually I applied to uh, undergrad as a theater major um, that didn't last long. Um, and I'll probably come back to that later. Um, I ended up becoming much more fascinated with um, things related to like ethnic studies and Africana studies. So that's what I pivoted towards. But um, the whole time I was active in this opera group. So it, like music was, in different ways was a part of my life forever. Um, I thought I was gonna go into academia. Um, I didn't and instead uh, went and did yoga <laughs> like on retreat. And um, my yoga teacher at the time was actually the person who suggested that I look more seriously into music because I had just learned a guitar and was singing a bunch there. So um, that's when I decided to actually pivot and change and think about music more seriously as a career. Um, so I moved back to the United States from living in Bali and didn't quite know what I was going to do, but I decided to um, either do music or do some form of gardening or landscaping. Um, and by and started with teaching private lessons. And then just by chance, I heard about the Kodai program, the Kodai uh, three week program and at Holy Names University. and once I started that, I got hooked. And so I realized I loved that. I realized that I loved classroom teaching so much more than um, private lessons personally. Um, and then, yeah, developed a really strong passion for pedagogy. So everything's just swirling around, but this is where I found myself and it feels really great. So were you trained as an opera singer? Because you said that you were interested in opera? More or less. And you have a beautiful voice. Yeah, pretty much all of my formal you know um, most of my formal training has been classical um so yeah i've taken classical voice lessons from age of six until i think 31. um it's been my one of my most consistent practices i recently have stopped taking classical voice lessons um i've also since joined a gospel oriented choir and so i'm i've developed an interest in expanding the ways in which i express music but yeah, I mean, I I had a lot of pride in being like a coloratura soprano and like loved doing all like fast, high runs and um, and still have not fully found anything that has the same kind of catharsis as singing really powerful arias. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that yeah, that's that's pretty much been my background and it's been a blessing and it's also been a lot of um, work to extend myself beyond that. Mm -hmm. If you weren't if you hadn't gotten into music, then what do you think you would have ended up pursuing? Because it sounds like you had a few different interests. Yeah, yeah, I have so many uh, alternate lives planned out. So I thought that I, I actually applied to PhD programs in cultural anthropology and thought that that was gonna be my future. Uh, then I thought that yoga would be my future. And then I thought maybe like gardening or some farming, something like that would be my future. I took that pretty seriously and here I am. Yeah, so I think this is my future. Um, I also recognize that things shift and I just have to be constantly aware of what um, feels like the best contribution I have to make in the world. And you're very um, passionate about social justice and you are a member of the Thrive Street Choir. So tell us about your social justice work and participation in Thrive Street. Yeah, well, 
this I think also connects all the way back to my childhood. My mother, or my on my mother's side, I'm half Japanese and um, I'm biracial. And my grandparents were interned in World War II. And I think that's come down in the family line in terms of uh, consciousness of what it means to be in America. Um, it was a point of pride and really supported in my family to to be involved in like campaigning or protesting to really care about what's happening in the world. Um, so that's also been a big part of my life since childhood. And all through undergrad, that was a big part of my life. I was involved in a lot of organizing then as well. And it seemed in some ways like the most clear combination of my, my passions is to have music and have a care for social justice. If, if I could, in the most simple way, combine them, it would be to be a part of this, um, this thing called Thrive Street Choir, which my friend uh, Kyle Lemley founded. It's a part of the Thrive East Bay community. And it also has uh, an aspect of music that I really love, which is that I think music is universal. I think as a music teacher, that's a huge value that I have. I think everyone is musical. Everyone has has a right to express themselves and has something to contribute with, with their voice or with their music. And so this street choir is not exclusive. The idea is basically that we come to protests and actions, oftentimes at the invitations of the organizers, and we we bring community songs. They're short songs. So anyone who's there learns the songs and gets to sing along. And what we build is I think a sense of strength and a sense of community. Um, Cause that's what you feel when you're singing together. That's what people oftentimes feel when they sing with others. It's not about perfection. It's not about the, the nuance of it. It's actually about the sensation of being together and doing something meaningful together. And additionally, when you're showing up for um, actions around issues that are incredibly important, there's that as well. It's like, we are here because we care about this. This is what we have to contribute. Um, and yeah, it, it serves so many functions. So it's it's been a real powerful experience to get to join in on that. And you're releasing an album or you just did, right? Yeah. And so that's actually, um, it, they get confused. I'm a part of the Thrive Street Choir and also the Thrive Choir. Um, and they're both out of Thrive East Bay. The street choir is beautiful in my mind because it's universal. Everyone is invited. And um, the idea is, I mean, we just takes, it just takes one powerful song leader to show up to an event and lead a song and the entire event becomes a choir. And with the street choir, or sorry, with the actual performing choir, it, that's an auditioned choir. We're just 12 people, no, no, 17 people. And um, we rehearse together and it's a little bit more, um, polished and um yeah it's a it's a different way of being in the world but i also love that one a lot too it's they've become my family and um yeah we created this album we have an ep that's coming out soon we have a music video um that i'm really proud of and it's the idea is that the music that we produce as that choir is music that will uplift and strengthen people, uh, especially people who are doing work for social justice. So those are selected songs from what the street choir might use in their different activities. Sometimes, sometimes the street choir songs can oftentimes are like four line songs. Um, and, and they're very easy to learn. The, the choir songs can be, you know, more typical like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, verse, chorus. Okay. Um, yeah, but there are a few things that we've taken from the choir repertoire. And like, we just take like the lines of the chorus and we'll sing them out on the streets. It's mm -hmm. totally happened. And I went to one of the gatherings that Thrive Street Choir presented. You brought people together at Holy Names to, yes. to show us what it's like and if we wanted to join and it really is very simply presented that anybody can join a protest and sing and it's yes. not like you say about perfection or being you know musical in the sense of having musical experience you can just jump in and learn it very easily and sing and it's very spontaneous yeah that's exactly what it is and the music is very inspiring and, and I found it incredibly moving to be singing some of those songs and 
I can see how that would benefit the um, motivation or the inspiration at whatever protest it might be. So tell us more then about how you see music helping or aiding social justice. Mm, yeah. I mean, when we bring songs to actions, they have so many different functions. And I, we even choose the songs by that. We have like a whole list of calmer, like more prayerful songs. And I think that's for us to like center ourselves and really come together and um, touch into our own intentions of why we're here and what do we, what, what are we trying to do when we are here? Um, we have more energetic songs, you know, which are really great for marches or long marches, things to get us through. Um, and I think because they're so short, they're, they have this uh, potential to be earworms. I don't, I don't I, that's the term I think in German. Yeah. I don't know if we say that here, but uh, you know, we're like, they just get stuck in people's heads. And so um, I think it's great for people who just show up to a march and they don't know something about it and they just go home singing that song because it keeps the, it keeps everything living within them. Uh, but I've also like heard really powerful stories too, like um, in actions where there's another side, right? People who disagree with why the action is happening and where they will respond differently when people are singing than when people are silent or when people are yelling at them. There's a, a de-escalation aspect to it. Mm. Um, and I think there's just a, more of a space for people's humanity to really come through, which I think is beautiful. Um, and last thing I'll say is like, it's a great way to encourage people who are doing really hard work. Like I've been at sit-ins where, you know, people are sitting down and they can't move or, you know, things like that. And if we sing for them, it also helps them. Like it helps them get through whatever they have to do to, to be where they are and to do what they're doing. That's really powerful. Yeah. How do you decompress and relax? Oh, uh, well, I'm in San Jose and I'm really lucky to be close to a walking path. So I, that's my favorite thing right now is just to go for walks on this path. We have geese and other birds. I saw a blue heron the other day while walking and um, the beginning of COVID, all the geese had had little gooselings, like little baby geese. <laughs> that's just one of the most renewing things ever is just to go and walk. Mm -hmm. um, and make my own music. Making music is, yeah, it, it serves so many things. And sometimes it's just an incredibly therapeutic thing for myself. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your taking the time to, to talk with me today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Catherine.